Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Catholic Coffee Talk, a podcast where in between sips we answer your Catholic questions. I'm your host, Father Brad Doyle, and I have with me our resident good Catholic, Peter Gone. Pita, you are not at the studio. You are in a different place. No, I'm not. I'm not in the studio. I'm actually right now at home. I had some offsite meetings today, and mm-hmm. when they ended, I was like, well, I, I could go past my house to the studio to record, or I could just go home and be five minutes early rather than five minutes late. So I decided to just come here and record, and uh, I thought I was going to be Listen. recording like off actually at, at Belmont Abbey where I was uh, interviewing the abbot. Um, for a little side project, but wow, throw throwing some flexes in there. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you know us. We're, we always got side projects going. We always got stuff cooking in the background. So I was over there at the Abbey, and uh, I I had like picked out an office. I have friends who work there, so I like, picked out an office where I was going to record this. Yeah. But then uh, things ended earlier than than I thought, so I had to. I ran here instead. But yeah, this is this is the my Abbot, home. The office. Abbot kicked you out. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Once they found out I wasn't happens. interested in joining the community, they said, get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> this is this is Abbott Placid still? Yeah, this is Abbott Placid. You know him? You've met him? Yeah, yeah. I've had friends uh, go to Belmont. Uh, oh, of course, Fent, of course. Uh, boys and and uh, my friend Ariel Roland Butterworth. She became Mrs. Butterworth <laughs> after she got married. It was interesting. Um <laughs> So look, it is uh it's it's creeping up there towards Christmas time mm-hmm. and uh I don't know if people know this out there but what is you, uh, I wanted to ask you what your favorite O antiphon was. Uh do you know what the O antiphons or should we explain it to the uh for our banter today? We're just going to talk about the O antiphons. Yeah, you know what yeah. the O antiphons my, are? My my answer to that question is super basic. You know what it's going to be. It's going to be O come O come I'm, Emmanuel. You just got to I just yeah. got to go with the OG, you know, at least from my perspective. Um, but yeah, explain what, what we're talking about for folks. So the O Anaphons, you, you've heard the song. Most people out there have heard the song. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Uh, you know, o come, O come, Emmanuel. Yep. And ransom captive Israel. Okay, so that uh, that's a chant, but it comes from a particular prayer of the church. And those actually aren't associated with the Mass. They're associated with evening prayer from December 17th uh, through up until Christmas Eve. So, um, so evening prayer. So the Mar- the Marian antiphon or the Magnificat, there's always an antiphon that comes in, in it. They're called the O antiphons because it's like, O come, O come, Emmanuel, right, O wisdom, o, o wisdom, O come, right, O wisdom yeah. from on high, O come, O leader of the house of Israel, o come, O root of Jesse's stem. Um, that is my favorite is, uh, o come, O root, root of Jesse's Jesse stem, stem, sign of God's love for all his people, come to save us without delay. Just because I love the imagery in Advent. I think the most powerful imagery in Advent is that uh, shoot of Jesse, right? The sprout of Jesse coming from the stump of Jesse, that sprout mm. um, that sprouts forth because of the line of David. And there's a, there's a lot of them, but uh, that's that's one of my favorites, I think. It's funny. I, I, I love that imagery, right? I love the idea of... Well, I just love the biblical imagery of, of gardens, of growth, of vines and, and um, you know, roots and seeds that are planted. I always love that imagery. But one of the reasons I love the O Come Emmanuel antiphon is because I think the meaning of the word like ransom is often Ooh. so lost in in the modern day. You know, so again, this is another kind of historical thing, but, um, you know, we know the the corporal works of mercy, one of them is to visit the imprisoned. But that mm-hmm. it used to be, or used to be listed often as ransom the captive, right? Because in warfare, whether you were a combatant or not, you would often be captured and held for ransom, right? Or enslaved until someone could pay up, right? Um, and even well, well into the Middle Ages, um, non-Christian peoples, like, like the pagan Vikings were famous for this, but then also... Um, Muslim raiders would capture Christians and then hold them for ransom. And there were whole religious orders that I don't think are around anymore because they don't have this need yeah. anymore. But they would, they would, their whole thing would be ransoming captives. They would basically solicit donations, right? And then negotiate for the ransom of people who'd been captured, right? Um, or in, at times, even 
go in the place of the captive. You know, Oof, yeah. You know, I say, all right, well, free that guy. Take me instead. You know, um, and so that that was a whole charism in in, in the church. But also, you know, even before Christ came to the earth, I mean, it was a huge thing about ransoming the captives who are who are enslaved. And and for us in the spiritual life, we're all enslaved to sin in one way or another. And so that imagery is one that's still, um, I just think, really pertinent. And I love, I love it. And I feel like we often don't have that kind of imagery that kind of understanding relevant enough in our modern day that like we are or we were enslaved to sin and we need Christ to free us. Absolutely. So go check out the O Anaphons. Oh, and Hey, uh, speaking an- oh, yeah. of the O Anaphons, if you are a member of good Catholics journey to Christmas series, that you can, you have access to our own proprietary recordings of the O Anaphons with the St. Joseph Co- college seminary, Scola, and they are phenomenal. They are an incredibly uh, beautiful part of that series. So, no Saint Joseph and and Dunwoody. That's here in Charlotte. Oh, college. Yeah, we got a college seminary here. Um, legit, because my 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 seminary is called Saint Joseph, and we did uh, the O Anaphons as well for recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did a recording and the recording, we never sold it or anything. Uh-huh. We just did it one year and it was all these Christmas carols. Um, and one of the car- one of the carols and one of the Advent, it was like betwixt, betwixt an ox and a silly poor ass. It's like one of the lines. <laughs> so that was the name of our album was betwixt, betwixt an, an ox and a silly, silly poor ass. Uh, Sorry. Biblical. Just, I always have to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. Come on. Um So anyway, speaking of being a slave and ransomed, I'm a slave to the segments of our show. So we're moving on. (laughs) I was wondering where you're going. What's percolating? All right. Yeah, let's go. (laughs) It's time for what's percolating. This is a busy time of year. Most Catholics find it challenging to prepare for Christmas and stay consistent with an Advent program at the same time. That's why we created a series to help you prepare for Christmas without feeling overwhelmed. Good Catholic's Journey to Christmas is a digital devotional designed to work with your busy schedule. It's simple, flexible, and spiritually rewarding. Each day from the first Sunday of Advent until Christmas, you'll get a daily devotional email that includes Christmas novenas, Advent wreath prayers, a spiritual Christmas crib, and more. You get to decide which prayers or novenas you'd like to stick with. There's no requirement to do them all. You'll also get a spiritual guidance video from Father Matthew Koth, backed by popular demand, each Sunday during Advent along with a written reflection that will keep your focus on Jesus during this hectic season. There's bonus content too, such as exclusive video recordings of the O Antiphons. Have your best Advent yet in Christmas too. Click the link in the description to watch the trailer and sign up today. Uh, where the questions percolate in your head gets answers, gets answers, get answers from the church's tradition. Mm-hmm. What, what, what's the percolating today? All right, we got two, two questions. Uh, we got one from an email and one from a speak pipe message. So I'm going to go for the email first. S- sweet. Um, now, both of them are about like prayer, specifically kind of the, the eff- efficacy and the effectiveness of, of certain prayers for people um, or from people. Mm-hmm. So it says, uh, first one is from Jane. She says, hi, this is Jane from Rockport, Tennessee. Are our prayers for naught if we pray for someone who is unbeknownst to us in hell? So say so you're praying for, for a deceased family member or someone who you know, who's gone before um, and... I mean, we don't really have a way of knowing for certain if they're in heaven or in hell in purgatory, and we pray for them because we kind of maybe assume they're in purgatory. But what if they're not? What if they've been damned? Are our prayers useless? It's a very sad thing to think about, right? Mm-hmm. But um, but I, I don't believe so, obviously, because any prayer, if it's true prayer, if it's from the heart of the church and from your own heart, um, is not going to be wasted, even if it's... Um, for a particular person who can't take advantage of that um, because prayer isn't just utilitarian. That's the, the, the word that came to mind mm-hmm. when I was preparing like an answer to this, this, uh, this question, uh, because sometimes our culture is very utilitarian. So we yeah. might think um, Jane, that, that, you know, if it's not doing the, 
the purpose of what I intended it to do, then it's not worth anything. Um, because that's what utilitarianism is. Things are only worth that, which they do. Mm-hmm. Um, but prayer is, is deeper than that. It's not just like an exchange. Like I'm asking for this. I get this. You give me this. And that's prayer. Uh, prayer is ultimately at its very heart and depth and encounter. Mm. Right. So we yeah. might be asking, I mean, think of it this way. Whenever you're going, you have a relationship with somebody like your parents, your grandparents, your friends, um, there might be some asking them to do you favors or there might be some asking them to meet you in certain places or whatever. But that's not the primary thrust of the relationship. Right. The thrust of the relationship is an encounter with the other person of which there's parts that are you know, transactional, but, Mm -hmm. but it's not just about a transaction. And that's, that's kind of what I wanted to drive home here. And so like, you might be in prayer asking God for something that's not going to be answered, but that prayer still is effective and good. If that makes sense. Right. Because it's still part of that relationship that ought to be multifaceted anyway and holistic. Right. That's what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also want to add to that. Um, that God is a super abundant God, right? He is super generous, right? And I say super generous, not just to mean very generous, but I mean like he is above and beyond above generosity. <laughs> um, and, and we can't even fathom. Um, so I, I remember reading similar things in the Divine Mercy Diary when we were doing our Divine Mercy series for Good Catholic. And God, or Christ was always saying, to Faustina or to us through Faustina that, you know, he is always looking to pour out graces on, on all these people, right? Especially poor sinners. Mm -hmm. And when the soul doesn't accept them for one reason or another, he sends those graces elsewhere to someone else who will accept them, right? That, that he, like his generosity will not be wasted, right? Mm -hmm. Because he will find where it is needed and where it can be used for, for his glory. And so if we are praying for someone and for whatever reason, you know, again, if they're in hell, they can't, they don't have access to grace, but God will send that grace on someone who needs it, whether it's someone, you know, or not. Um, so it won't be useless, right? Our intercession will still have an effect I mean, I, I think I'm not quoting a, a church father here or anything, but in in that yeah, mystical well, it's, tradition, it's I think a, God it's will a mystical yeah, tradition. Like God will help someone, right? <laughs> I, I think I think we can trust to that. Yeah, I, I think that's that's reasonable, uh, but also attested to in the spiritual tradition of the church and the mystical tradition. And obviously we've made this distinction before, you know, private revelation isn't public right. revelation. Right. So even some things that are fantastically uh, supported by the church and have never been uh, really, or at least now aren't preached against, like something like Faustina's visions right. and, or are they and the divine mercy chapel. Or Fatima. Well, mm-hmm. you know, Fatima is is like an approved apparition where um, I don't know if Faustina and her diary have the same uh, uh, level true. of uh, approve, approval, but it, it's, you know, it's gotten imprimatur right, from right, bishops right, yeah. and theologians and it's not it's not sketchy. But but it, there is a difference between div- private revelation and public revelation. Yeah. But we can allow it, basically the difference just means that we're not we don't have to assent to it. Like if it's public revelation, like every Christian right. that, has to assent that, that's, to public revelation. That's more what I was meaning with Fatima, that you don't need to believe in the miracles of Fatima to be a Catholic in good standing and to be in communion with the church and that sort of thing. Maybe it doesn't classify as private yeah. revelation, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, I think that answers that question. Basically just pray and, and God will work it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you your, know? your prayer will like never he, be wasted. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Yeah. And I always like to add in that at the end of uh, certain prayers, especially when I'm praying with people, uh, you know, people will ask for mm-hmm. particular prayers for a miracle. I'll pray for the miracle. And at the end, I'll, or for a person or what have you. And um, I'm always say, I just pray like Jesus did. He told us to pray our father. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I'll do that. Um, but I'll always say, not my will, but yours be done or not our will, but yours be done. Um, which remind, reminds me this time when I was, I was in high school, we were preparing for a mission trip and my friend, uh, Joey, they, they were like, we're about to go on the mission trip and they're like, Hey Joey, can you lead us in prayer for the, 
for this mission trip. And we're like, we were the only two Catholics on this Protestant mission trip. And so, so like he got all uh-huh. nervous and he was like, Oh yeah. Yeah. And he like did this long prayer. And at the end he goes, not your will, but mine be done. <laughs> And then, and then we all just look around and like, I, I could tell the Protestants are like, what is that? Some popery there? <laughs> papishness. And, uh, and I was like, I mean, not, not our will, but anyway, let's move on. Let's go. <laughs> no, it's not my will, but yours be done mm-hmm. to the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Okay. So I, I just really don't want to get in the way of one of my favorite aspects of our show, which is speak pipe. So just lay it on me. Hi, this is Sandy from Atwater, California, and I have a question about praying to saints. Um, I know that we pray to saints to ask them to intercede for us, but is it also okay to pray to a deceased family member and ask them to intercede for us in our special intentions? Thank you and love your show. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sandy. Love hearing the voices of listeners. There's real people out there. It's not just us. (laughs) You know, every week I I stare at Zach's face and Peter's face and that's the only faces I see. And it's, you know, they're beautiful faces. They're great. I love them. But, but, uh, well, ontologically, you know, God made it. So, Uh, but, um, so Sandy, love, love hearing, hearing the voice, hearing your questions. And I think this is a, a really great question. A lot of people have, and, and, um, of course, yeah, I, look, we pray in, in the liturgy, right? So the liturgy of the church, the funeral rites of the church, uh, we, we trust in God's mercy. A lot of the language in there, um, mm-hmm. always struck by it. it's like, you know, we trust that you love them, that you're drawing them to yourself. Um, you know, we always trust in God's mercy that he, he desires people's salvation, mm-hmm. um, and that, that he's given them the grace necessary for their salvation. Um, but. I think your question also brings up uh, maybe a distortion of that. So, so to answer your question, Sandy, yes, I think it's good to uh, pray to a deceased family member. Um, and, and with, with the caveat, be like, you know, as you behold the face of God, you know, as you mm-hmm. go before the Lord, pray, you know, pray for this or, um, you know, especially those who exhibited a, a high level of sanctity and a relationship with the Lord mm-hmm. here on earth. Um, if they did here on earth, look, the Lord loves them. He wants to draw them to heaven. Um, but we shouldn't not pray for their soul as well. So there's this, there's a, uh, a theme or, or a trend, I think in modernity to either canonize somebody who has passed away, um, which is not what you're doing, Sandy. It's not what we would be doing if we, you know, prayed to a deceased family member, um, but to never mention praying for their soul or to never mention mm-hmm. that they possibly need help and purification would be to canonize them, which does them a disservice. Right. Let's say if they are in a state of purification, they are mm-hmm. in purgatory, they do need prayers and we can participate in that. We would be denying them that. So we canonize them. We like a priest. It's so tempting as a priest because you want to be with somebody. You want to comfort them. You have all these family members who are very sad or very depressed. Yeah. You get it. And the temptation is to, and I feel it myself, you know, and I, 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 you know, believe myself to be an Orthodox priest who wants to, to teach the church's teachings and guide people in the truth. Um, and it's still tempting for me. So to, to say like, you know, Oh, this person's in heaven. You know, I right. never say that, you know, I say, I say, we trust in God's mercy. He loves them. He's, you know, we pray that he draws them to himself mm-hmm. um, and which is the truth. Yeah. Um, but never to canonize. Uh, have you heard that in funeral homilies before? I have, I have, um, where it's kind of again it, it's it's out of i don't know it's it's, it's the kind of thing i don't want to criticize it too harshly because i know it comes from a desire to comfort the 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 deceased family right and to co- comfort the living and it's out of a desire to perhaps draw like draw attention to the glory of god and the mercy of god which are good impulses and good things to do but i think you're right that Mm -hmm. at the end it is it can be kind of a a false charity or a miss a misdirected charity because we forget about the needs of the soul which is the purpose of the mass which the purpose of the funeral is to care for their soul um you know so i i've heard that where we kind of just say oh they're in heaven now right 
Well, that's that's something that someone says you might hear often is, you know, the funerals are for us. They're not for the, uh, you know, the, the, the deceased. The, it's a Protestant mentality. The wake? Sure. The funeral mass? No. <laughs> that's 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 my mentality. So so the so that would be canonizing somebody would be like just pronouncing them in heaven without any uh, prayer necessary or any uh, idea of like their soul need to be purified, which mm-hmm. isn't good. But there's a, there's also another uh, thing that happens, which is like um, making people angels. Right. Oh, so this sometimes yeah, happens. And you, yeah, usually on the back on the back uh, on the backs of cars. Right. I, f- I see that often like mm-hmm. the person's like, you know, ha- like a sign or a, an image or a statement. It's like, oh, an angel. And, and you might. And look, again, it's it's not about it's not people being vicious or, or malicious or trying yeah, to be true. heretics or anything. True. It's just it, it, a lot of times I think it might even go back culturally to a, a very popular and a movie I'm showing at the parish. Uh, I'm going to definitely address this after. But it's a one. It's a wonderful it's life. A wonderful right. Life, yeah. So in in it's a wonderful life. There's a an angel who says he was a human being who died and he's trying to get his wings, right? Yeah. So there's this like false anthropology yeah. and amalgamation of like spiritual beings and, mm-hmm. all, and us and human beings yeah. and who we are. So it's not a full Christian anthropology and it's a wonderful life, um, at least in that sense. And so that kind of bleeds into maybe our, our popular culture. And so we don't understand, which just takes catechesis, right? Yeah. So, um, so, Sandy, you're not dipping into any of this. You, you just had a good question that kind of right. helped us yeah, that, uh, launch yeah, off. Her, her into question else. is kind of ancillary to other common misconceptions out there. So we're just, yeah. I love that movie, by the way. It's a Wonderful Life. I think it's, it's a very phenomenal good. movie. A, a bad anthropology inside. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weeper. It's a weeper. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I remembered what I was going to say earlier. Oh, okay. What's up? Um, at, at funerals, what I try to do is always direct people to have trust in God's promises. So, okay. so instead of me promising, like I'm not promising, I'm not saying they're in heaven. I can't make that promise. Mm-hmm. But you know what Jesus says? He says, if you receive my body and blood, you will have life within you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so what, what I especially, and, and it's really awesome whenever I have the opportunity to point out to people you know this person received the sacraments before they died. They received the anointing of the sick. They came to Mass when they were alive. They, they worshiped the Lord. They gave him their whole life. And he promises us this in Scripture, in John chapter 6. And then John 15, he promises, he prepares a place for us in heaven. So I don't rest. I don't preach on my own promises. I preach on the promises Jesus gives us through the sacraments. And it also does a cool thing, which is catechizes people. Hey, you should receive the sacraments before you die, because that's where we're sanctified is through that encounter with the Lord and his grace through the sacrament. So I always point our assurance, right? A Protestant might be say blessed assurance. Mm-hmm. Well, our assurances are based off of the promises that Jesus gave us through the sacraments. So I always kind of point back to that in funeral homilies. Yeah, that's th- thanks for sharing that. I, I want to share a little something. Um, I know we were probably going to talk about sacraments as well, in terms of last sacraments and funeral masses and stuff. But it just got me thinking about um, actually my, my late cousin who passed away five years ago this month. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I won't. I won't go into too much of it, you know, because it's kind of for me and my family. But um, he had a couple, a couple near death experiences mm-hmm. where we almost lost him for one reason or another. Um, and then he, in response to that, kind of rediscovered his faith um, mm. and started attending to the sacraments. And, you know, got a spiritual director. Was much more faithful to mass. Much more faithful to the Eucharist. Um, Made it made some good changes in his life, you know, and and then one day, um, I mean the the his various again experiences had also revealed some health problems um, with his heart, and then one day about five years ago, he God just sort of took him and he just didn't get up in the morning, um, and his heart wow. his heart went, and it's heartbreaking. He was about my age, um, and. You know, families, of course, still wrestles with that. And, and we pray for him. 
Um, but I just, I think about that as such an incredible mercy in that he got, God called him into the sacraments, right? And God, God called him closer and closer to him as he became closer to what would ultimately be his death. And when I think about that in terms of the promises of God, right, that uh, I just immediately think of, of him and that story. Yeah, that's look, funerals aren't sad to me anymore. Uh, I've, you know, I do funerals all the time, multiple a year, you know, dozens and dozens. And, you know, funerals aren't sad to me because death is, you know, memento mori is constantly before me. Right. What's sad is lack of faith. That's mm-hmm. literally more sad. You know, Jesus approaches Jerusalem and he weeps over Jerusalem. Um, not because of any suffering they're going to endure, but because of lack of faith. And, um, and he rewards those who have faith. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so that funerals can be fantastically beautiful, even if they're sorrowful because it's the death of a young person, as long as they're Mm -hmm. in the sacraments and have their hearts prepared, their souls prepared, it could be really good. So that's how we want to reply. Sandy is that, um, you know, just, Let's all make sure that us and as much as we can, our family members receive the sacraments, have a relationship with the Lord, and and that we're all prepared. We never know the day nor the hour, as the Lord uh, told us. So, But it is the hour for a little pick-me-up. Absolutely. We got the bean of the week. You all need a little pick-me-up. Here's ours. Um, Peter, you have, a, you have one? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I always have a laundry list of books that I want to tell people about because they're great. And I've shared uh-huh. my, my I don't know, more than a few books here at the beginning of the week. But I want to just uh, kind of harp on the same theme I talked about last week where I talked about kind of those urban parishes. Um, I mean, today I spent some time out at Bellin Abbey. And again, there's Bellin Abbey College that people know about. But I was like, I was with the monks, got to eat with the monks and got to spend some time with the abbot. And again, that's all for a side project that's going to hit Good Catholic eventually. Um, you know, hint, hint, but I just want to give a shout out to all the monastics out there, right? I mean, they're probably not mm-hmm. listening to this because they're monastics, but chances are wherever you are, dear Catholic listener, there is a monastery or an abbey somewhere near you. Mm-hmm. Whether you find out where they are or not, just like offer some prayers for them because what they're doing is great. And I just, I just loved witnessing the... I don't know, just the existence of monastic life <laughs> in our modern world, right? I mean, I'm going about my normal day, right? And there's the interstate and there's the towns and there's cities and all this stuff. And then like tucked away in this little town is this beautiful little abbey with these these men who are just living in the community of, of Christ. And it's just great to see. And I always mm-hmm. love seeing it. Um, and monasticism, I think, is such a leaven in society. So I just want to give that a shout out because that, that really lifted my spirits and it's good for my soul and uh, that was my that was my pick me up this week. That's what kind of picked me up today. Uh, picked me up this week. So, uh, yeah, just shout out to all the monastics. Send them some love. Send them some prayers um, because mm-hmm. they're doing the Lord's work. Sweet to all you monks and brothers and friars and nuns and sisters out there. We love you. Um, hey, it's almost Christmas. Yeah. And I know some people are sticklers about not celebrating it, but I'm going to do some uh, Christmas trivia as my pick me up. All right. So um, let's, let's see if you, uh, you and uh, you know scratchy voiced uh, Zach, Zach can... you on this. Come on. All right. All right. Zach's in on, on it. it. Yeah. All right. Let's let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, he's got laryngitis yeah, still. still. Laryngitis. <laughs> Okay. Okay. These are so good. I don't. Okay. I don't think I've asked these before to you. So geography. What is both five thousand seven hundred fifty nine miles and five miles from Jerusalem? I need y'all to talk it up. Five thousand seven hundred fifty nine nine miles and five miles from and Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Five miles from Jerusalem. Yep. I mean, the borders in that part of the world are real weird. Um, <laughs> I'm like, is it a country? 
Uh, that would five thousand is a little much for miles, like we're for a border, right? I guess so. What's above? Because United States is three thousand across, so. Oh, that's true. Five miles. It's probably Bethlehem because Bethlehem is right outside Jerusalem. Okay. And there's probably some other place named Bethlehem. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yeah. It's it's called Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Ah, okay. So Bethlehem <laughs> is the answer. All right. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay. Uh, history. On Christmas Eve 1968, William Anders, uh, Jim Lovell, and Frank Borman made history as the first people to broadcast to the entire world from the moon's orbit. From what book of the Bible did they quote? <sighs> no idea. Yeah, same. Well, I mean, it's a multiple court choice question. Oh, we got oh, like 72. Perfect. Oh, that's great. There we go. 73. <laughs> Is it two or three? 72 or three? What? Books of the Bible. Oh, yeah. It is a multiple choice. I thought you were going to give me options, Father. <laughs> no, I'm not. That is, it's, it's a multiple choice question. Uh, I mean, technically. Um, ooh, gee, I don't know. I mean, if it was Christmas Eve. Uh-huh. Wouldn't they do the gospel? Do you think they would do Luke? I think I'm just going to guess that because it was Christmas Eve. Okay. Well, it was Old Testament. Oh, they yeah, quoted yeah. from Le- Lamentations. Right, no, no. I'm joking. That would be very <laughs> depressing. Well, they quoted wait, was from that Genesis. 13? James Lovell, right? I mean, I know he went back up. N- no, uh, this is 68. This is Christmas Eve in 68. Oh, okay. So this is, this is before Apollo. It was Jim Lovell. Yeah. Genesis. Genesis. So like the mm-hmm. creation account, I believe. Okay. We're going to have two more. You only get two more to redeem yourself. Okay. All right. Um, nutmeg is native to what co- continent? Another multiple choice question. Afro Eurasia. That's a good. Answer. One landmass. <laughs> That's a good answer, Peter. <laughs> no, I need I need the arbitrary continent. Uh, I. Hmm. When it's the spice, I always think Asia, but it could honestly be Europe, because I just th- I think that's like so ingrained in Christmas tradition. What do you think, Zach? Do you have any idea? I have I no idea. Let's let's say Europe. Okay, it is Asia. Ah, dang it! That was like my first guess. You, you thought was, too much. It was one of those. Yeah, it was like don't Cla- trust your first instinct kind of thing. I don't know. <laughs> Cl- classic fail. Uh, with you know overthinking any it. kind of trivia, overthinking yeah, it. don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Okay, last one. This one is okay. Uh, Christmas jams. The popular acapella group Pentatonix uh, have made a living from their Christmas albums uh, for the past so many years, yeah. decade. Uh, what does their name Pentatonix refer to? I think I know it. It well, there are five members, right? I okay. remember when they were going viral. So, so Penta being five. Okay. There's five members, but then there's also pentatonic scales in music, which use five notes and always harmonize with each other, no matter what, no matter what uh, order you play them in. You are smart, man. Which, it is the musical scales, the pentatonic yes. scale. Fun fact, pentatonic scales, are like the black keys. I mean, you know this, that the, all the black keys on a piano yeah. are a pentatonic scale. So anyone, uh-huh. so here's here's a fun trick. Anyone who knows their way around a piano keyboard a little bit, just play all the black keys and A natural. And that is a blues scale. And if you do that, You'll sound like a jazz You can just musician. jam. You could solo. You could solo exactly. on top of somebody and just be like, Ugh. Yep. All the black keys Ugh. plus A natural. Great way to fake your way through a jazz band. In case you ever find yourself in that situation. Hey, uh, there is one question that I didn't ask you all because it's very particular. But there's this group in in the West Bank in New Orleans called the 
uh, Benny Grunch in the bunch, and they have okay. instead of the twelve days of Christmas, they have the twelve yats of Christmas. And uh, the question was, what does his true love give to him from Araby in the twelve yats of Christmas? And the answer is a crawfish. <laughs> and a crawfish they caught in Araby. <laughs> So anyway, you've been listening to Catholic Coffee Talk with me, Father Brad, and our resident good Catholic, Peter Gohn. Coffee Talk is brought to you by the Catholic Company and is part of the Good Catholic Podcast Cooperative. If this episode has blessed you, you can find more content at goodcatholic.com. As always, we ask you to leave a review, rating, share the pod with a friend, or simply pray for us in our mission. If you have a question of your own that has been percolating, Shoot us an email at askapriest at goodcatholic.com, or you can leave a voice message at speakpike.com slash Catholic Coffee Talk. We might feature your message in a future episode, and we'll answer all your questions to the best of our ability. To quote the psalmist, taste and see that the Lord is good. Continue to drink deeply from our great faith. We'll talk next week. Peace. <laughs>